Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is the 25th of October, Thursday, 2012, and our special guest is Jamie McMillan, who is the author of Legendary Learning. Welcome, Jamie. Hi, thanks for having me. Really fun to have you here. Delighted that you agreed to do the interview. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. Uh, thanks to Mighty Bell and Blackboard Collaborate for support. I am on the Hack Your Education Tour. Next stop is Boston next week. Go to hackyoureducation.com and feel free to join us. Lots of fun conversations about what's really at the heart of education. We have these great worldwide conferences now, several, uh, and some really fun ones to announce. Uh, the Learning 2.0 conference was in August. It uh, is all free and up at learning2.0.com. The recorded versions are. And then the Future of Libraries conference, which was earlier this month at library2.012, sorry, library2.0.com or library2.012.com. And then coming up is our Global Education Conference, which is so much fun. So that's the 12th to the 17th. We're still accepting proposals. Uh, hundreds of sessions, great keynotes. Great, just great this year, and a, a huge amount of outpouring of support. And we're announcing in March we're going to hold a school leadership summit, uh, which will be a lot of fun. And we're going to hold a worldwide STEM conference. So lots of fun coming up. Again, all pure professional development. Next week on the Future of Education, Cal Newport on his new book, So Good They Can't Ignore You. Uh, this is going to be interesting because I think Cal is going to be in direct conflict with the interviews we've had this week, but he's been on the show before. I really like him, and so it should be fun to have that conversation. On November 1st, Yale is going to talk to us about dependency, from dependency to success. Can't wait for that as well. Lots of good is coming up and more to be announced shortly. If you've missed any of our shows, they are all recorded. Yesterday we heard from Denise Pope at Stanford on Challenge Success. Uh, dovetails brilliantly with tonight's interview and the work that Denise is doing, uh, just terrific work. Susie Boss before that on innovation. Kirsten Olson also dovetailing nicely with tonight in, on her book, Wounds, Wounded by School. Uh, lots of great lessons there. Blake Bowles on Better Than College. Anyway, lots to listen to if you're so inclined all in full Blackboard Collaborate form and in MP3 versions. So this is where you get to indicate where you're listening from if you're in the live studio audience. Look for the star to the left of the map. It's the second icon down. Double click on it and then click on the map. I'm in Park City, Utah, where we've had probably a foot of snow. It melted a lot yesterday and it's now back up to about eight inches. I'm just kind of stunned after a very low snow season last year. Just brilliant amounts of snow today. Feel free to put your location in the chat. Uh, somebody is giving us an international audience coming from Southeast Asia, and we really appreciate it. OK, moving right along. So there is a Mighty Bell space for this interview. Mighty Bell is the new content and curation program created by Gina Bianchini, who formerly created Ning. I do consulting work for Gina. Here's the link to the Mighty Bell space. You can add links in there, have conversation after the show. It's a way to continue the conversation. I believe Jamie's already gone in, so she's in there if you want to go in. I signed in there earlier. Good for you. So Jamie, I just loved this book. Um, it was really fun to read through. Uh, there, you know, there were so many sort of gems in there that I want to call out tonight. Um, why don't you tell us how this project started? Oh, well, thank you for that, Steve. 
Um, well, this started because I have been homeschooling my three kids uh, for a number of years, and I'm one of those people that loves to do research. So I have read so many books on homeschooling and teaching and raising kids because I really wanted to do the, the best job I could. And, you know, it's kind of nerve-wracking to be a homeschooler because you know you're doing something different that maybe some people don't approve of, and you really want to do the best job you can. So that's why I did all the reading. But the problem is that a lot of the books conflict with each other. Um, there's different philosophies on the best way to raise kids and the best way to teach kids. And, and I tended to use, um, you know, I, I swing like a pendulum from one method to another, more control versus less control. And I decided that I really wanted to look at um, people who had alternative educations um, and see what they had in common. You know, not just did they get into college or didn't they get a job, but what did they do with their whole lives? And I'd seen this list on the web of famous homeschoolers and uh, decided it would be really interesting to see if there was anything they had in common. And I tried to keep an open mind about it. I didn't want to prejudice myself one way or the other, so I made up this little worksheet that I started filling out for each one. And each person, I, I read uh, either one or several biographies, depending on the sources I would, had available to me. And it became so interesting that I just made a full project about it. Um, and soon learned that there was quite a few things they had in common. It mainly had to do with the roots of success. Uh, so I'm not so sure that this has, it's just about homeschoolers or just about kids who were taught uh, differently and not in public school. I think it has a lot to do with success in general. So I think so too. And um, and I'm, I'm guessing that that you would agree that most of the people who you profile in the book or the anecdotes that you use of these famous individuals would not have called themselves homeschoolers, right? So you had to create a classification of what you would consider to be someone who would qualify. So how did you do that? Yeah, that was tricky. Uh, of course, you know, I didn't want to go way back because if you go back too far, everyone was really uh, educated at home. Uh, this um, public education is a fairly recent phenomenon, so it it was tough to decide, you know, it, did it have to be a certain number of years, or did their parents have to intentionally teach them, or hire a tutor or a governess? Um, I finally decided, just based on the people that I studied, and I did discard some of them. I decided some of the people I looked at didn't truly qualify as homeschooled. I tried to just pick people who had spent at least a few years outside of school, uh, out of prescribed schooling, outside schooling. And uh, it didn't matter if they were tutored or if they had um, private instruction, I could still consider that homeschooling. And so most of the people I studied, they, they fell into two groups. Either they went to school as youngsters and then dropped out as adolescents and continued their education at home, or they were taught at home until they became adolescents and then were sent off to private school or something. There were very few people I found that had been legitimately taught at home the entire, their entire youth. So you wrote the book for the homeschool audience. If I were to retitle it for the general education audience, I would probably use the phrase that they were self-educated. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good way to describe it. So I interviewed uh, Kristen Olson uh, about her book, Wounded by School, and there's a, there's a very interesting parallel with her book and yours. Um, she actually interviewed people that she felt were um, important learners, meaning the work that they did in their lives depended on being good learners. And this was a part of a, a project she did while she was at the Harvard School of Education. And she discovered a, a very significant and troubling consistency for her, which was that almost all of them, and these, are, these were adults who depended on being good learners, had um, had to overcome what they felt were 
negative school experiences. And I think that that probably would be this, I think, except for one person in your, that you profile in the book, all of them had sort of negative feelings about formal schooling. Is that correct? Yeah, just about, yes, every single person I studied had negative feelings about the formal schooling they had received. And the one exception for me was Louis Armstrong. And uh, he he spent most of his life poor and on the streets and kind of fending for himself. But he was uh, sent to a boys' school uh, as a result of uh, a, a judge had, had decided that he needed to go to this boys' school. Uh, for one year, and that was the best year of his life. <laughs> so he loved it. He didn't want to leave, but then he was uh, released into his father's custody. So we're going to look at what the kind of the lessons have been that you've learned from studying these individuals, and I think they are you know, highly applicable to any kind of learning environment. I think it's going to get really interesting as we talk about potentially how they might be applied to to educators who listen to this interview. Um, and there's a large list, but were there any that were really particularly interesting to you? I mean, I find that you kind of dwelled on Einstein quite a bit. Was that because he was particularly interesting, and were there others? Well, the two that I think I found the most interesting were Thomas Edison and Andrew Carnegie. Uh, Einstein, in fact, I don't know if I, he would be qualified as homeschooled because I think he went to school most of his youth. Um, I used him as an example because he was in Howard Gardner's book on creativity and it was a nice example of the stages of creativity. Um, but I thought it was really fascinating to read about how Thomas Edison and Carnegie and also John Muir, he was another one of my favorites. They had such interesting stories how they uh, ended up teaching themselves and overcoming really difficult childhoods. Um, I, and I can tell you one of their stories if you'd like. Yes, please do. And I said Einstein, but I meant Edison. Oh, OK, yeah. Edison is really, he's a poster boy for homeschooling. Homeschoolers love to use him as an example uh, because he had a hard time in school. The teachers thought that he was uh, he was dull and had little initiative and not much potential, and his mother was incensed. So she took him right out of school and um, decided to teach him herself because she had great confidence in his abilities. And he was. He was a very sharp little boy, and there's a lot of anecdotes in his biographies about the funny things he would do. Uh, like one time he got caught sitting on the nest of eggs in the barn, chicken eggs, trying to see what would happen. So there's lots of stories like that. He was a very inquisitive, curious kid, and uh, very determined. And so his mother did uh, require that he read certain books. He um, was often called in from his play to do his reading and his writing. But he had plenty of free time to work on his experiments. When he was 12, he got a job as a, a newspaper boy on the, the trains. And that really expanded his horizons. He had access then to a library, and he was very entrepreneurial, very interested in making money. And um, you know, he, he had a whole series of projects, always forever learning things, teaching himself. Uh, and it continued on into adulthood, of course, and he's very famous for that. Um, I also loved to hear about Andrew Carnegie, because he was also a real feisty little kid, and he, he bucked his father's uh, stern ideas of what education should be. His father wanted him to go to school and get um, classical education, learn Latin and Greek, and have a higher education. But he was really interested, interested in science and inventing things. He was particularly fascinated with sound. Uh, and it just so happened that his grandfather and his father were both elocutionists. Uh, that's something we don't have these days. But back in the Victorian times, these were people who gave lectures about the proper way to speak. Um, it was something they were really interested in at the time. And young Andrew was fascinated with this and sound. And you know, he taught his dog how to speak by having his dog growl. And then he would move his dog's lips and jowls to make different sounds. Um, so when he was finally allowed to go study with his grandfather in London, 
Uh, the grandfather was um, fairly liberal. He allowed him to study what he wanted, attend lectures. The only requirement was that he had to dress like a gentleman and keep up with his reading and learning Shakespeare. Um, and that was a turning point in his life. He, he felt that that was when he really came alive. And then after that one year in London, he, he you know, banged heads with his dad again. And finally, they got it all sorted out. And he was able to um, continue learning sound. And he eventually taught deaf children. And, and then, of course, went on to invent the telephone. But I love stories like that. I love to hear how people, these feisty kids, persisted until they found their passion and then finally settled on what it was they were going to do with their lives. So I want to talk about the patterns that you've seen. And the book is organized not by individual, but by this uh, set of patterns. And uh, But before I do so, there were some kind of common arguments that I would imagine come up as, as you talk about this. Um, and one would be, um, is this a, a biased subset of individuals? Meaning you've chosen individuals who had some success, so we look back at their childhood. And are we missing some significant number of uh, individuals who had similar childhoods who didn't go on to achieve that kind of success? And how do you address that? Yes, I did make note of that in the book. It was unfortunate that in order for me to research people, I had to find some way of learning about them. And for me, it, the best way was biographies. And of course, biographies are usually only written about people who are famous. And I don't mean to imply in this book that fame equals success. I really do think there's been a lot of wonderfully successful people out there who just weren't perhaps famous enough to have a biography written about them. Um, but the, the other intent for writing this book was that I, I wanted to give courage to homeschooling parents who were perhaps afraid of taking that big giant leap of faith into self-directed education. And I thought by using these people that they've probably heard of, and I wanted to find names that homeschooling parents might have heard of, because that would be um, kind of a reassurance that Yes, these people did it too, and it's okay. You know, it's not such a strange thing to trust kids to educate themselves, and and that was one of the reasons I chose these famous people. But I don't mean to imply that that is the only measure of success. Well, again, I'm going to reiterate that I really agree with the lessons that you've drawn out of the book, but a, but a traditional educator is also going to say, um, what a what about students who don't have a family life or a family where they have at least one strong parent or adult influence or, or are even in a position to not worry about food? Um, you probably don't have an answer for this because the audience is homeschoolers, but I'd be curious to, to know if you've thought about this at all, which is how would these apply to, to students and youth who are not in family circumstances that would allow for sort of the things that took place with these youth? Well, I have thought of this, and, and it bothers me a lot when I hear about kids in such difficult circumstances these days. But I think back to some of the people I studied, like Irving Berlin and Louis Armstrong and even John Muir. They had really, really tough times as kids. I, I mean, I could easily say that their experiences are just as tough as some of the ones nowadays. Um, but the real difference is, um, I've decided, I, you know, after giving this much thought, I think the real difference is mentorship. The, um, the kids who had tough times and, you know, no hope for the future, the difference, where well, they did have somebody who looked after them, someone who gave them hope that they could do something better than what they have now. Uh, you know, Irving Berlin, he was out on the street singing in brothels and, and saloons to just earn pennies to support himself. You know, he was literally homeless. And, um, but he did, he enjoyed singing and he learned from the older buskers, that was what they called them, the people who sang for money on the streets. And he picked up tips from them and, you know, he looked for people to teach him how to play piano. He, he kept working his way up. 
with people who were just a little bit higher than he was until he could see his way out of this this place that he was. And it, you know, I, I make that sound really easy. I know there's a lot of kids in terrible circumstances these days, uh, but I truly believe that mentorship is the way out of it. So uh, let's talk about the for the construction of the book and and the the principles. I, with my cell phone, I took this photo. <laughs> it's not a great photo, but this is the diagram you use to kind of describe your conclusions. So do you want to sort of talk us through it? Sure, thank you. That's very nice of you to do that. Um, yeah, so the, the two big things that I found that everyone had in common that I studied were passion and determination. And the, each of them had found something that they truly loved, but they also had acquired this capacity for determination to actually do the hard work that was involved in achieving the success that they found. You know, just having a passion isn't enough to get you there. And then the base of that, beneath the passion and determination, was the atmosphere, which um, I decided atmosphere was really about um, their upbringing. And uh, again, not all of these kids had perfect households, but they had at least one parent figure or grandparent who loved them completely, absolute unconditional love. And they had a very rich atmosphere. It wasn't stifled. They weren't sheltered. They participated in the community around them. And I think that was really important. Um, you know, Louis Armstrong, he was submerged in his New Orleans culture. Irving Berlin was submerged in his New York City culture. It, it was reflected in, in the mentors that they found and, and the people that helped them rise above uh, their circumstances. So I guess it's all three were important, um, but the passion and determination were the things that really made them stand up above other ordinary folks. So we'll go through this one at a time. Am I right in reading this diagram that the determination portion of the triangle is is large on purpose? Yeah, yeah. The determination is very large, and it is a perfect triangle because, um, well, in the book I, I lay out the different aspects I found that helped kids become determined were. Um, the positive mental attitude and uh, self-discipline initiative and uh, learning from adversity. I do think adversity is actually very important because the kids learn from it and they grew stronger and they became determined to reach above where they were. Um, so I, I do think that that's the bulk of it, you know, that uh, and learning a, a work ethic and learning how to take control of themselves and uh, you know, keep going even when they'd rather do something easier. Uh, and a lot of you know, there was some examples of Andrew Carnegie in my book. Uh, he was a poor kid in Philadelphia, growing up in a time where there was a lot of opportunities. There was a lot of other boys who were doing the same thing he was. They were messenger boys. Uh, they were learning to take telegraph messages and deliver them. But Andrew Carnegie was a little bit different than the other boys because he really worked hard at it. He decided he was going to be the best messenger boy there was. So he decided to learn all of the famous, or all the businessmen in town by their faces. He knew their names, and he could deliver their messages to them right on the street. Uh, he was what everyone called plucky. You know, he took that extra step, and he was determined to be the best. And the other boys didn't really appreciate that. They they made fun of him and they excluded him. They tried to get him to do what they were doing, which was slacking off. But he was really determined. And of course, that's what made the difference in the long run, why he became you know, a multimillionaire and they didn't. So the question every parent and educator asks is, how do I help um, facilitate that kind of determination? And I made sort of a list 
uh, and, I, and I discovered they all sort of they fell into one single category for me, which I actually wonder if it isn't for me more the heart of the book than anything else, and that is um, freedom to be self-directed, the need for independence. Um, so, so I will quickly list them here, and then you can drill down on them. But if we're thinking about it, the role we play as adults and how would we facilitate somebody being determined or giving them the opportunity to be determined, uh, I wrote down learning to manage oneself, not doing things for them they're capable of, not confusing initiative and discipline, allowing autonomy, um, allowing self-reliance and discomfort, and recognizing that the goal goal is mastery. So I've sort of put them into my own little bucket. D does that fit with your own feeling of how you would help somebody become determined? Yes, I think it's important to for parents to remember, well, and it's a hard thing to do, that it, if you allow your kids the initiative to make their own choices and make their mistakes, uh, very often that is in conflict with what the parents want their kids to do. Um, so I tell one story in the book of um, a parent, a family I know who they have two very meek little girls who um, their, their mother was well-meaning. She was a great protective mother, but she dictated everything the girls did all day long. And every time the, the girls were presented with a choice, they always looked to her to see what they should do. And and, of course, she would decide for them what they should do. But she was also a very liberated mother, and she was complaining about how her girls never took the initiative. They, they wouldn't step out and, and raise their hand or offer a suggestion. But, you know, maybe I should have said something, but it seems that they didn't have any practice with initiative. I, it's pretty clear that the kids that I studied were very independent. They didn't have someone dictating every moment of their day. They had to make a lot of choices for themselves. Uh, they had to choose how they spent time. They had to make mistakes. Uh, a lot of them had to face adversity. There's some stories in there of kids like Gloria Steinem and Eli Whitney who were um, burdened with a lot of responsibility at a young age for taking care of uh, their sick mothers, taking care of siblings. These are all things that build. It's like a muscle. You know, if you don't use it, it's not going to get stronger. So even little kids have to have the opportunity to do hard things. And that means taking care of themselves, doing chores. Kids are capable of so much more than we give them credit for. You know, right now my, my daughter is going to a public school, but she, she comes back and she's always amazed at how little her friends know how to do. She says, Mom, they don't know how to cook. They don't do their own laundry. They don't know anything. <laughs> and I, I think there is still a tendency, even for kids in high school, for their parents to do way too much for them and to expect that they aren't capable and, and they want to help them and, and they care about their kids. but. They really need to give their kids a lot more room to do um, their own thing, even if it means they wear dirty clothes to school. You know, they, they can be responsible for that choice and that action. So explain what you mean when you say that you think we sometimes confuse initiative with discipline. Well, initiative is the idea of making um, choices, choosing how you spend your time, choosing what you do with your time. And um, if a child chooses to spend their time watching TV or playing a video game, then the parent might disagree with that. The parent would rather see the kid doing what they want to do, which is very often involved with discipline, you know, that um, it's, a, it's a fine line, I guess, you know, parents trying to influence their kids to get them to do what they want them to do, but then that takes away the, the freedom of choice from the kids. And in this book, remember, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, kids should be just given free reign to do whatever they want to do. I think discipline is important. Uh, and there are certain boundaries that every kid has to learn to get along in society and be polite. 
and uh, you know fit well with their community. But the, there's so many things that parents don't need to provide discipline for. It's really not necessary. It's just a, it's an issue of control. How much control do you give them? And I think really kids should be given more control and more credit for being able to do things. Which isn't to say that adults aren't um, don't have good intentions when they do things that are controlling. Of course, most most of the time the intention is to produce a valuable outcome. But I think what you're pointing out is that there is a significant difference between somebody conforming or obeying and someone taking initiative. And the control brings forth the obedience, but it doesn't necessarily bring forth the initiative. Is that fair? Right. It is definitely a sliding scale. If you were to look at it, you know, total control on one side and total freedom on the other side, uh, I think there needs to be a balance somewhere in the middle. And a number of the people that you profile, and you're very careful about this in the book, you know, they go through very serious discomfort, right? I mean, th these these would not be things you would wish upon someone, but but clearly, these difficulties allowed them to to develop some self reliance and some independence. Yeah, uh, John Muir is one of my favorite examples of that. He. He grew up uh, in Scotland and came over to the United States at the age of 13 to start a homestead with his family. And of course, starting a homestead in those days is backbreaking work. And his father was very, very strict, he had no sense of humor whatsoever. And he worked uh, John, who was his oldest boy, just hours every day. And he was out there, you know, plowing, planting, building fences. And in the most particularly, he was building a deep well, a 90-foot well. For days, months, he was working on this thing all by himself, chipping away at the rock. And the, the lack of sleep and the lack of food actually ended up stunting his growth. He had a very difficult time. And trying to get, because he wanted some time for himself, he trained himself to wake up at 1 o'clock in the morning so he could do some of his own projects. He liked to invent things. Um, but, you know, he, he suffered for it, and he, when he was finally 21 and was legally allowed to leave home, he never went back to his father's house. So it was a very trying experience for him, but he, uh, of course, you know, he, he developed a lot of self-discipline, a lot of self-reliance. When he decided to head for the hills and learn wilderness, I mean, he was all on his own for, for years. He just wandered on his own living in the woods. So it, it helped him in a way, but I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Okay, so determination is is one of the keys here. And if, if we aren't, most of us aren't homesteading. So it does require that we actually make a conscious effort to be willing to allow for independence, to, to let uh, our youth or children make mistakes and, and to grow through uh, growth experiences. Um, let's move to the passion piece. And do you want to talk a little bit about the trends that you, or the themes within passion that you felt were important for helping someone develop passion? All right. The, the two things that I felt developed passion the most were creativity and self-education. And both of those were based really on freedom. So the the ability to uh, have free time and less regulation to, to explore what they wanted to learn. Uh, a lot of these kids that I studied, they had things they were interested in, and they just needed the time and the space to explore them. You know, of course, I already told you about Alexander Graham Bell. Um, you know, Louis Armstrong was very interested in music. Irving Berlin was interested in music. Some of the kids didn't figure out what they wanted to do till they were older, um, but they still had the freedom to explore these things. You know, Pearl Buck is one of my subjects I talk about in the book. She was taught at home uh, by her parents who were Chinese missionaries, and she had um, a regular 
curriculum that her parents chose, but she really preferred the time on her own. She went out and talked to the, the neighbors in the countryside and spent time reading novels in the out, outdoors. And of course, she loved to write. She wrote, wrote the stories that she heard from her neighbors. Um, so I think that the kids need time to process what it is they really want to learn about. And, and kids will often switch from one thing to another. It's not apparent right away that, oh, they're going to be a scientist or they're going to be an artist. Sometimes they switch from wildly different interests. They might be interested in horses and then soccer and then, uh, and then perhaps biology. You, know, you just never know where their interests are going to take them. And that's OK. It's important not to pin kids down too soon. Uh, but eventually, given the freedom, they find what it is that they're really passionate about. You know, Agatha Christie, she didn't start writing her stories until she was 18, when she was bedridden with a sickness. But all of the things that she had done prior to that, you know, she loved to read. She loved to dress, play dress up and wear disguises with her big sister. She had gone to pharmacy school. She had traveled around Europe and Egypt. So all of these things came together for her when she finally started writing her mystery novels. It, um, so I, I think it is important to give kids the space to find that. Uh, don't push them too early. There's no rush. Um, but they do need the freedom to discover it. So I see this being really hard both for parents and for educators, right? Because the moment you say, you know, the 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 significant turning point wasn't until they were 18 or 22, uh, what Dan Coyle calls the ignition or Howard Gardner's crystallizing moment, right? The the I can just see that it, the Agatha Christie's parent, well, she's not probably a good example because I don't know that much, but if my own child at age 17 were still kind of playing around, I would be feeling like I, I the temptation to to sort of come down hard would seem to be ever present. Yeah, I think that is that's tough. And and that is one of the reasons I wrote this book is because I I realized well in personal experience too with my own three kids, it's nerve wracking. You know, you don't want to mess your kids up. You don't want to think that you let them down and you didn't give them the education that they needed to be the best they could be. But it gave me a lot of comfort reading all of these stories for all these people. Um, you know, Steve Jobs, he gave an example in that, that famous commencement speech at Stanford. Uh, he gave a speech that's known for connecting the dots backwards. And, you know, in his life, he didn't know what he wanted to do. And he was in college, and he felt he was wasting time. So he just dropped out of college and started taking classes he was interested in. And um, Ultimately, you know, he figured out what he wanted to do uh, with developing Mac. But it turned out that some of the things he had learned previous, like typography, came into play and helped him develop Apple in a way that was different than Microsoft. Um, he called it connecting the dots backwards. And I think that's a really important point to remember. You can't connect the dots forward. You really can only connect them backwards. And it's easy looking at these famous people I studied. You go back and look at their childhood and say, oh, it makes so much sense. Of course that's what they would do. It's so, you know, George Patton, you know, he played, spent his entire childhood playing soldier. It's so obvious that he would grow up to be a soldier, a general, a great general. But it's really not obvious until it's already happened. So it takes a great deal of faith. Um, and, and that's why I wrote this book, is I really hope to give people the faith to give their kids that opportunity. So we've talked on the show about agency and this idea that um, self-direction is the most critical thing. And my father always used to call the role of a caring adult in this context of being uh, disinterestedly interested. I, the, some people talk about it as the grandparent role or the friend, where you're, you know, there isn't emotion related to how you relate to the, to the youth. Um, but I would imagine that both for parents and for teachers, there's kind of this critical moment when somebody else is looking at the situation and says, "Why haven't you done more? 
right? So if I'm a parent and I'm allowing my child self-direction and agency, uh, I hear voices of other people saying, you know, why aren't you taking a more active role? Why aren't you doing more? Or if I'm a teacher, I can hear parents or administrators saying, you know, you can't just not do anything. So how do you cope with that moment? Oh, I really love that expression, disinterestedly interested. <laughs> I love that. Um, well, one of the things that I advise parents is to keep a journal because I find that you often do way more than you think you do. It, it sometimes feels like you're just living life uh, that you're not doing school. And this is really frustrating in your kids when people ask your kids, so what do you do all day? And they say, oh, nothing. But you know if you keep a journal that they really are doing quite a bit. It's just that it doesn't seem like school. So I, I think it's important to take notice of all the little things that you do, uh, whether it's, you know, the chores. And, and a lot of times the kids' interests will read them in ways that that can be turned into something schoolish if you phrased it a certain way. You know, for instance, my oldest son, he really enjoyed working on screenplays and creative writing. He loves to write. It's usually something with fantasy or sci-fi or monsters, but he would really spend hours working on that just for fun. And I didn't make him do that, but it obviously contributed to something we might call English or, or writing class, but he did it all on his own. He didn't need me to make him do it. And likewise, I had another son who you could hardly get him off the computer because he was fascinated in everything that had to do with tech. You know, programming and applications and learning about the hardware. He was fascinated. And he also took it upon himself to learn personal finance in the stock market. And he read a biography of Warren Buffett. But I didn't make him do any of that. Um, but it's important that I keep notes because it comes in handy when I'm trying to come up with a transcript later for what it is they did. So I, I do think parents have to somehow turn what their kids naturally do into some kind of um, uh, format that regular school administrators would understand. Uh, but it's surprising how much they will do if they're given the opportunity. And you, you don't have to always worry about, does it look like school? Does it look like a course? Does it look like math? Just take what they do and make that fit into school language. So there's a, there's a good segue here from the passion to the atmosphere. Um, and for me, that would be the authentic, real life, real people, real problems, real work, real decisions, uh, circumstances. That it's, it's really important to have um, real life meaningful activities. Uh, do you want to describe why that's so critical? Yeah, one of the things that I noticed was that uh, the environment that these kids grew up in was very um, authentic with the adults around them. It wasn't a carefully crafted environment for learning or for children. It was real life. Uh, they they learned from the role models around them. There was one of the books I read about how children become scientists that was really interesting, and, and the author interviewed lots of scientists asking how it was they became interested in what their childhoods were like. And most of them described a very rich uh, home environment where their, their families were interested in learning things. It wasn't that they bought all this stuff just for the kids to practice science or pretend to be scientists. These parents were really legitimately interested in the things they were doing. They had projects. They had hobbies. They had stuff in the basement. And the kids were welcome to join along. And, and of course, kids are natural imitators. They love to see what adults are doing, especially if adults are doing something interesting. You know, you can't hardly keep kids away from that. So, you know, and it doesn't have to be family. It could also be the community. Uh, if you don't have anything going on in your own household, I think it's important to take kids out and about, take them to museums and um, field trips, uh, show them real places, show them people working. You know, because kids are smart, they know that they're going to be an adult. They want to see what adults do. And they don't want to be uh, patronized or looked down on or given toys that are 
meaningless and 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 stupid. <laughs> you know, they want to be given credit for for their intelligence and their own uh, sense of worth. So that that is why I felt in the section on atmosphere, it was important to point out that we don't need to create anything special for them. That it's important to work on our own uh, hobbies and interests and include them along in it. You know, I um, I really love the Thomas Jefferson education, and I feel like that was one thing I really got from one of the things I got from Oliver DeMille was this idea of um, work doing things yourself and modeling, and that if you're exploring and creating and learning, that that's probably the most powerful thing you can do to influence your your child to do so. And I think educators recognize the same thing. Um, and and I think you describe very well in the book how when that's authentic and not sort of manipulated for the purpose of influencing the youth, that it really does have a huge power. Yes, I really, I really believe in that. I guess there's an exception. Um, Montessori classrooms I described in the book, they have these specially crafted environments. And I, and I think those have some value. I, I like Montessori. Um, but I, I do think it's really important for homeschooling parents to lead by example and have rich, uh, fulfilling lives. And uh, too many parents live through their children. They seem to hover, you know, you've heard the term helicopter parenting, and, and they just everything they do is in terms of their child. What's, you know, what's going on? What can I do for my kid? And that's not really healthy. It's important for parents to be learning at the same time, to be modeling everything they would hope that their kid might pick up, that modeling good habits, uh, good work ethic, um, and, and to keep learning all the time, learning new things. So this is really hard in the school environment because increasingly, um, I just spoke at a in a school district in Canada where they have been asked to take down any personal information that might be visible to the students for fear of an inappropriate relationship developing. And it seems like that very kind of human sense of somebody else as a learner or as somebody who's passionate about something um, is is getting even more restricted in the traditional school environment, um, out of fear, of course, but that those are the, the mentors or teachers who've really influenced my children the most were the ones where they kind of saw them as a full person, understood what their lives were like and what they cared about. Um, so I, again, I know that's not your, the traditional education is not necessarily your domain, but I do find it interesting that, that we, we in some ways seem to be pedaling backwards here. Oh yeah, I agree. My well, right now my youngest, my daughter, is going to a public charter school, and it's interesting to hear op her observations about her teachers and the schooling and what works and what doesn't work for her. And she really loves the teachers that she knows something about, um, the ones that she has some personal connection with. I think that's really important for her. And in fact, there's one teacher that she feels really nervous about, but it's because that teacher is not authentic. You know, she smiles and she tries to keep her control of her temper, but then every now and then she'll snap and she lets her mask off. And so my daughter describes this as being really scary because you just don't know who this person really is. It's so apparent that she's putting on a facade that's not really her, and it's disturbing, and my daughter really doesn't like that class. But the classes where the teachers are frank and they share some of their personal lives, or they bring their kids into class sometimes, uh, or they even have a Facebook page that uh, they allow students to check in on, um, those are the teachers that my daughter loves the best. Okay, so um, there's also and, and Denise Pope yesterday uh, in her Challenge Success, uh, the interview I did with her, talked a lot about this. But um, you know, this whole idea of time outside in nature seems to be so critical. Oh yeah, yeah. I talk a lot about that in the book. I uh, I found it um, 
pretty interesting how much time each of these people spent outside. And, you know, it's hard to say whether we have to spend a whole half day or full day outside to get the full benefit. You know, I'm not sure if there's been any studies on that. But anecdotally, uh, just about every single one of the, my subjects, even the ones that grew up in the cities, like, um, like Beatrix Potter, you know, she was uh, given the freedom to go to the uh, Museum of Natural History by herself, and then she spent her summers in the countryside of Scotland, which of course was very important if we were ever going to get, you know, Peter Rabbit out of that. Um, so they all had that Victorian sensibility of getting outside and doing nature walks and keeping nature journals. You know, I found it interesting that even Thomas Edison, who spent his time in the laboratory with light bulbs and stuff, he knew all the different plants. When he went out on a nature walk with his kids, he could identify more plants than they could. Um, so it was a very common phenomenon back in those days, and I think we've really lost that. Um, of course, we have something new now with the internet and, and everything that that gives us, but you know, I, I encourage parents, especially for younger kids, I think it's so important for them to wiggle around and move and make noise. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I decided to homeschool my oldest is because he was full of energy, you know, typical boy energy. And it was a lot to handle. He tried going to first grade for a couple months, but he kept getting in trouble. And, you know, we would always have meetings with the teacher and the principal. And, and they were all very well-meaning, but I could feel that they were on their way to recommending he get on some kind of medication to help him calm down. But I knew he didn't need that. I knew he didn't have any attention deficit disorder. So I decided to homeschool him. And it was okay by me if he wanted to wiggle around. I could read to him and he would stand on his head and flip around on the couch. But he heard every single word I said. So um, he just needed a lot, a lot of exercise. And as I learned with them. Of course, I didn't know everything when I got started. I made a lot of mistakes. But as I learned, I realized how much exercise he really needed, even as a teenager. And my daughter, she's a teenager now. She needs, um, you know, a good, she has um, the sports team she does for four hours a day, four times a week. And she needs that. If she doesn't get it, she gets really cranky. Uh, so I think if more parents gave that a shot, if they're having trouble with their kids and the kids aren't focusing, uh, it's really worth trying to get them outside and getting more exercise. So what's intriguing about this, Jamie, is just the um, I, I'm I'm sitting between these two worlds, the, the homeschooling world, which we have done with uh, our kids off and on, and the traditional education world, which I'm largely a part of in terms of my professional work. And just how far from what you've described the education environment is for most students, and there are lots of valiant efforts and, and people doing great work, but by and large the traditional education environment uh, sort of works against all of this. And and probably that's why Kirsten Olsen talks about the the wounds from school and why your um, legendary learners you know look back at schooling with sort of uh, negative feelings. Um, I want to ask you a question that um, I ask the, my guests who are mostly in the traditional education field, and I'm interested to see if you have a different response. So a lot of the discussion that we have around education in this country revolves around. Um, producing students who will be good workers in order for our economy to get better, in order for us to be competitive. Is that, you, is that a goal that you see as a part of homeschooling? Because I'm guessing that it's not. And how would you describe the goal of education? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're right. I would not put that as one of the goals of education. Um, but I, I understand, you know, my husband and I have talks about this all the time because he's an engineer and he's very concerned about the lack of of uh, kids graduating in the STEM fields. And and I know, you know, our, our country has a lot of problems. We would love to get more scientists and mathematicians and uh, engineers out there and get graduate degrees. 
so it is important uh, for our community and our world, but I really think that some of the best innovation, particularly in science and engineering, came from kids who were already interested in that. They didn't have to be coerced. They didn't have to have a rigorous science uh, curriculum to get them interested in science. It was just, it, it was, you know, it was just something in their bones that they couldn't help it. They just had to learn. They were curious. Um, and I, I don't know how that would translate into regular school. It's something that I do think about. I, you know, I happen to be a fan of school choice and charter schools. Anything that would give kids and parents more control over their own education, you know, I'm, I realize not everybody can homeschool. I, I realize that's a very small percentage of people who can realistically homeschool uh, for one reason or another. So it is important for to do our best with public schools, do whatever we can. But the more choices we give people and the more control over their local school system, then I think people will be more vested in the outcome. They'll be more willing to volunteer and participate. Uh, you know, the school my daughter is in now relies heavily on parent volunteers. And I think most teachers will tell you, and administrators will tell you, that parents make all the difference. So, it, it, you know, the message here might be that if you want parents to help out and to be more involved in their kids' education, you have to give them more of a say. And you have to give kids more of a say. However that's done, you know, I'm certainly no expert. It's a really complicated issue. But, um, I really think the more control you can bring down to the local level, the greater the results. Even if that means that you're not dictating, you know, some grand uh, goal-oriented scheme for more STEM students or graduates. You know, I think the federal government, the state governments, they can come down with all kinds of guidelines. They can come out with resources. That's all good. But the bottom line is, People need to feel like they have some control. They have some choice. And when they do, then they'll want to work hard at it. They'll, they'll do their best and they'll volunteer. I mean, that's, that's my belief anyway. I, again, I'm not a, an expert either on this, but I, I did read an article yesterday that was talking about the um, um, Situations where I'm trying to remember what country it was, where they Chile, I think, where they've had school choice for 40 years, and the the counter argument is that it largely serves a very select small portion of families who are capable of maximizing that choice and doing a good job, but for a great number of students, it doesn't work. And I think this is a little bit of a dilemma, right? Which is. Um, the same kind of freedom you want to allow for students, you would have to allow for families, which means that some families won't get there. And you know, how do we feel about that as a society? How how do you feel about that? Yeah, that's true. There will always be um, families and circumstances where that are not perfect. You know, that are not conducive for kids to learn and do the best they can. And uh, in that case, definitely the maybe the last hope for these kids is the mentorship. I, you know, again, as I said before, I think that makes all the difference. So, you know, whatever local communities can do to provide opportunities for mentors, and in some cases that is the school. You know, if, if kids don't have any other role models, they've at least got the teachers. And so, the best teachers we can put in those schools, the the better. You know, and and of course, you can also have role models and mentors, whether you like it or not, to media and, uh, you know, celebrities. They provide role models. Uh, anything that gives kids a picture of what might be. Uh, it, so, you know, I do think public schools are really critical. Uh, it would be nice if we could hire more teachers, you know, have smaller classrooms, allow kids to have more connections with those teachers, and, and meet people and coaches and, and youth leaders. As many people as we can get involved in that kid's education, the better. So, Jamie, we, um, as a courtesy to our guests, we always finish on time. So I really want to thank you for coming on the show. I mean, I know you're coming into an audience that's 
you know, more traditionally or oriented toward traditional education. But I, I, again, I did love the conclusions of this book. It's going to keep me thinking for a long time. This is not new material for me necessarily, but I really like the way that you brought it out, and I really appreciate you coming on the show. Oh, well, thank you very much. This was fun. So I, I know Kent had a question that I, I, I didn't ask just because I was concerned it would take us over on the time. Are you comfortable putting your email address in the chat in case anybody wants to correspond with you individually? Oh, sure. I'll put that on right now. Okay. Thanks so much, Jamie. Thanks to you for attending, those of you who are here. Uh, thanks for listening if you're listening to the recording. Next week, Cal Newport comes back on the show uh, to talk about his new book. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day or evening, depending on where you are. Bye now. Thanks, Jamie. Bye. Thank you, Steve.